Hey guys, welcome back to Clownfish TV. This is Neon. I'm here with Geeky Sparkles. Hello. And we got a lot to talk about in this video. We're gonna, yes. And Geeky's all fired up. I am. And we're going to talk about Hollywood geek media dying, the comic book industry. Uh, I don't even know what the hell is going on. I guess I guess shrieking as it's as shrinking, I shrieking can, and shrinking. I can, I can sum it up. It's bullying and BS. Bullying and BS. So that is that is the new Dungeons and Dragons bullying and BS. Uh, we should we should crowdfund that. We should make a game. Speaking of crowdfunding, uh, we're having a micro crowdfunder. If you guys haven't checked it out yet, we just launched it yesterday. Twelve days for this Clownfish TV enamel pin. Uh, very limited, very limited. So if you don't get it now, you probably won't get it. All right, and that's enough enough for the shill. Yeah. I will put a I will put a link in the description, or you can go to shop clownfish. Dot com. So let's talk about uh, a, a multitude of things. Okay, multitude. So we've been kind of covering the decline of uh, digital media mm -hmm. and the decline of the comic book industry mm -hmm. and kind of the decline of tabletop gaming and the decline of all these pop culture uh, uh, things. And, you know, I, I'm going to say the unified theory of everything for me is that Pop culture started to go down the tubes when Hollywood got more involved in like the niche things like comic books and tabletop gaming and anime. And one of the biggest, uh, I would say biggest offenders or, or one of the things that, that kickstarted this whole thing off was Nerdist. Mm -hmm. Nerdist kind of centralized all these Hollywood geeks. And well, I think it was a, a, a that and, you know, a, a shift to uh, not be based on, you know, good characters, good story first. But like, well, it's because it's this, that or whatever checkbox. And then, you know, story comes secondary. That had a lot to do with it as well. Well, I think it's I think it's the Hollywood influence. Uh, I think the Hollywood politics came into kind of niche uh, nerddom when when we started you know sites like nerdist and uh, geek and sundry and all of that where we had the hollywood nerds mm -hmm. and and like actual nerds are starting to see through it uh we had the same sort of mentality with a lot of these gaming sites and all of this kind of you know was in the last like five to eight years is when uh you know it became very uh hip to be a geek when it became hip to be a geek and Hollywood wanted to cash in, they're like, awesome, we're going to cash in on nerd culture, but we're going to... Change it. We're going to change it all. We're going to change it all. Let's say they're going to change it. And uh, again, sites like like Nerdist and Geek and Sundry, in my opinion, my personal opinion, um, kind of led the charge for this uh, change in pop culture. Now they're dying. Uh, they're not doing very well. Legendary, uh, which bought Nerdist a couple of years ago, cut its staff by 30% in digital. And this includes Nerdist. Just and as of Center. when? Uh, as of like a day ago. Oh. Yeah, so this is Legendary Entertainment. Uh, the division has not been a priority for Legendary as it focuses on more lucrative film and TV businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is very obvious. I'm going to show you some numbers here. Layoffs are happening at Legendary Digital. The Hollywood Reporter has confirmed the group, which includes Brands, Nerdist, Geek and Sundry, and Smart Girls, is shrinking by 30% or eight full-time well, positions. Well, they're not that big to begin with. The eight full-time positions is 30%. No, but I mean, the thing is, is we're talking the difference between probably having a YouTube channel that's active and not. I mean, we do everything ourselves, mm -hmm. you know, and we actually get more traffic than Nerdist does. I'll now. tell you what's going on, and it's not just this; it's on blogs in general. It's on why the stuff's not selling and things like that. People are just sick of the bullshit. I yeah. mean, that's at the end of the day, they they're tired of it. They're tired of uh, um, you know, smoke and mirrors and finger pointing and constantly being told that they don't like something. There's something wrong with them. Probably they're problematic because they don't follow these people what they think. I think they're just tired of it. And so they're just like, we want the truth. We want honesty and we don't want you. Yeah. I, th I think that's what it is. I think that people are just, they're just seeing through your shit. Like you used to be able to, you know, BS people and, and bully them into thinking they're bad people. If they don't agree with you. But now people are like, you know what? No, enough, enough's enough. I'm not a bad person because I don't like Star Wars. I'm not a bad person. I don't like She-Ra. You know, I'm tired of being told because I have friends that aren't white. Um, well, those are your token friends. I'm like, really? What if I'm the token friend? You know, I'm just like, you know, everybody's tired of it because they're just like, it's stupid. It, take your shit and shove it. Shove it back where it came from. Yeah, put it back up your butt put it call back. it a day. I do not have a butt thing. Just... Yeah, why do we always, why does everything turn into butt butt stuff? Anyway, 
Um, yeah, so here's, I mean, you can see the correlation though. And I've been, I've been watching this for years. You know, we used to do the con scene. We saw kind of in real time, the comic book industry, especially, which is tied very much to like Nerdist and stuff like that and tabletop gaming, which is tied to geek and sundry. Mm -hmm. And we saw sort of the Hollywood infiltration, mm -hmm. you know, as it were, as you know, these movie studios bought these blogs and YouTube channels to use as their marketing arm. But that's it. That's it. Yeah, it's about promoting their stuff. It's not about the truth. People know it. They can sniff out the BS. Yep. Yep, so here we go. The digital brands have become less important to the strategic direction of Legendary in recent years as the online content business has shifted away from networks that grew big during the early heyday of YouTube stardom. Legendary Digital is not a money maker for the business the way its core film and TV divisions are. Uh, the seeds of Legendary Digital were planted at the company in 2012 with the acquisition of Chris Hardwick's Nerdist which began with a podcast and expanded into digital video. He cashed out. Holy Yeah, hell. but then he got accused of stuff. Yeah, and then, and then he turned like, disappeared. Out, but then it turned out that he that you know he, he had proof it. that he didn't do it and then you never hear anything from him. But then a bunch of his staffers walked out too, you know. So But it doesn't matter if you have proof that it's not true. It doesn't, uh, matter. doesn't matter because someone said it has to be true cuz if you don't believe it you're 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 just you're condoning it and you're a bad person. Yep, Legendary added Geek and Sundry and Smart Girls, the YouTube channel and media brand started by Amy Poehler. So I gotta wonder if they're coming out, Hollywood is coming out and saying like, this YouTube stuff isn't really worth it for us, but we know that's not really true. I think it's, it's more Hollywood can't YouTube mm -hmm. because people can smell the bullshit. They know it's not genuine. They know it's just marketing for these studios. So they're failing at it. And I think like Brie Larson, I think she's going to fail at it. And that seems to be the MO of a lot of these celebrities is they go start um, a YouTube channel or something and then they sell it off. They, mm -hmm. they use it to market themselves or whatever. And people are seeing through it. So the reason that, you know, channels like Nerdist are, are dying is because you know the real fandom has has moved on to a ton of other YouTubers that are like themselves, that are given their hot takes, given their honest opinions, and they can't Hollywood can't stand it. So th what they'll do is they'll divest themselves of this, and then they'll attack it from the outside. And we're seeing that a lot too. Those YouTubers are all 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 right. Yeah, Keep that's what you can see. And, and what's funny is if you actually probably look up numbers of, of people that are actually legitimately alt right in the country, there's no way that everybody they claim is alt right is alt right. No. So it's just look, people are sick of the, the the lies, and that is what it is. You said it's it's just one giant you know circle jerk for the for these media. That's why they bought blogs. If you look at the blogs; they're all owned by big companies. Yeah. Um, because they sold out, and now they're just used to promote whatever they're they're pu you know pushing and then some of these people are showing up on these networks behind the scenes and they're uh, and then the, then the journalists come out here and then they start pushing the the narrative out on the public mm -hmm. and it's like people don't believe you anymore you you did all the damage to yourself people don't trust you yeah and that's that's it that's why the audience left i mean trust me there are more people now than ever watching youtube they're just not watching the hollywood shit especially when it comes to pop culture because mm -hmm. they're like you guys are just trying to sell us a movie you're trying to sell us uh games you're you're definitely trying to sell us ideology i mean we saw this with with tabletop gaming i think the the real change with tabletop gaming you probably can trace back to geek and sundry you know that once hollywood got involved and got their politics involved and started you know th then they started demanding changes right and then people are like you know what and then by the time people realize what's going on it's too late even though we've been sounding an alarm for a while now but um you know it's about youtube my kids they hardly ever watch regular tv they watch the hell out of youtube yeah and they watch they do watch like you know some of the streaming services i like that uh paranormal con on camera because they think yeah. it's funny to uh you know well that's obviously fake but um they don't really watch you know, a lot of television. We don't either. We pay for it, but we don't even usually use it. They, they're they on YouTube all the time. Yeah, it's so weird because, uh, you know, I mean, this this is a generation. Our, our kids, you know, are Gen Z. They grew up with YouTube. And our kids, I remember before they'd go to school in the morning, they used to watch, I mean, early YouTube. We're talking Annoying Orange. Mm -hmm. We're talking Fred. I mean, this is stuff they were watching in grade school before they would, you know, catch the bus. And they literally grew up with YouTube. A lot of kids today don't even watch network TV. And that's why everybody's you know freaking out so much because they're like, oh my God, we got to get the kids. But then the thing is, is they, they fundamentally do not understand how YouTube works. So they attack it from the outside. We're going to talk about that because this ties. They attack all, everything. All of this ties into what's going on with comics this is right gonna now. It's going to be a long one, guys. It so is going to be a long get one. Get your popcorn. 
take a comfy chair and get ready. Yeah, so um, I just want to pull up Nerdist's stats. Now you can go Social Blade and you can check the public stats of mm -hmm. pretty much any YouTube channel unless they're private. And look at this. This is this is a Hollywood, a slick Hollywood production that they've got sets and they've got whatever, and they're they can't even break a hundred thousand views a day. That's bad. Oh my gosh, they're claiming they have two point seven one million subs and two, they're only getting like you know their best 60, day was 50, like their best 40. day was eighty two. Yeah, it's not good, and not for the overhead they have. And you're you're lucky if they make a couple hundred dollars a day. Yeah, that's not that's uh, not good. Yeah, you know, so they're obviously not paying for themselves. I don't know what they're getting in banner ads, but we know that banner ads are, are dying too because of uh, coronavirus. You know that a lot of people aren't spending the money. Um, Geek and Sundry, another one of their brands. Again, I, I'm I'm going to go out and I'm saying it. I, I think the the change, all the ideology that's been introduced to tabletop gaming. In the last couple of years, you can trace back uh, to Geek and & Sundry and, and their gaming stuff. Now, they do better. They get a couple hundred thousand views a day, but that's not great not for... Not for 2.1.2 million. Yeah, there are YouTubers that have under a million subs getting almost a million views a day. Individuals yeah. that don't have the overhead. I mean, how many staffers they have to pay. So they might be making you know $1,000 a day, but split how many ways, and then they have to pay for the marketing and all that. And when you're dealing with a company like Legendary that's used to, you know, multi-million dollar movies, mm -hmm. um, this is going to look like chump change. Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. Easily. Uh, you know, I mean, it's great for individuals. I mean, individuals like, yeah, you can make pretty good money uh, if your channel is big enough. But again, you look at the subs and we, we looked at this with Marvel, too. Marvel has 13.9 million subs on their channel. They get a couple hundred thousand views a day. Now, the other day when I did the video talking about comics and Marvel Comics, they were doing a live stream. Do you know how many people they had watching their live stream? How many? 291. Oh. 291. Not thousand. 291 people were watching a Marvel Comics, Marvel Entertainment live stream on a channel that has 13.9 million subscribers. Allegedly. 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 So now Hollywood is kind of divesting themselves of this so you know the good news i guess is that there is a chance for i think the fans wow they went nerdist lost ten thousand people in the last 30 days um there is a chance for fandom to kind of come back and dictate the kind of content well, that's because, what needs to happen yeah because it used to be that it was you know fan conventions fanzines fan blogs that kind of you know, stoked the fire and kept things alive. And now, like you said, all these blogs, even ones that start out as fan blogs, have been purchased by Hollywood Studios. Yeah, like I mean, once upon a time, sites like the Nerdist were actually that called that because they they geek out, nerd out, they yeah. you know be about actually about the fans. But there's such a great divide between um, the creators anymore and the fans because they don't want to listen. They want to push a lot of it's just because they want to appropriate things that, that weren't theirs and and just do it their way, which isn't you know very creative and not very fun. And then you have the fans who are like, "What the hell are you doing?" And you know, no matter how many times you tell somebody there's something wrong with them. And you keep losing money, maybe, maybe, just, you know, just stick with me for a minute. Maybe the problem isn't them. Maybe the problem is you. <gasps> How very dare you? You're just trying. I dare. To, you're the just problem's probably you. You're just trying to gatekeep. What's the common denominator here? Yeah, um, it's Hollywood trying to control. Basically, it's, um, where did I see it? I think it was World Class Bullshitters. I want to say it was World Class Bullshitters did a video a couple of years ago. Uh, and they talked about Bolshevik marketing, which is basically the illusion of choice. There is no mm. choice. And so what we're seeing now, I think, and this is kind of the unified theory of everything, is a pushback by the creators and the blogs and the YouTubers and whatever that all came in during this Hollywood era of geek media. And they're getting pushed out. And they're trying to use every avenue they can use, the media uh especially because they it's every much bullying tactic they can use every bullying tactic they can use social media everything that they basically have commandeered for the last five to eight years they're trying to use it now to turn on fans and to turn on creators who want to just go back to creating outside of this system well let me ask you a question if you're gonna have if you're like walking down the street who are you more likely to listen to and have a conversation with the person that comes you know sitting there talking and you're like you know talking about what they're upset about and what you know what we can do better um you know and and have a discussion about why their opinion is right or wrong or the person standing on the street just screaming it's the patriarchy it's the patriarchy it's the patriarchy who do you think people are going to listen to 
You know, who do you think has a chance of at least having a discussion? Not the person sticking their fingers in the ears yelling at some patriarchy. And I'm sorry, but that's how, I mean, whether it be patriarchy or whatever term you want to use, that's how this all comes across because there is no discussion. They don't want to hear it. Their answer is you're all going to do what they say or else. Or else what? Because um, frankly, the one we're not the ones who are hurting here. It's them. You know what I mean? The fans yeah. they can go elsewhere. They don't. You need them more than they need you. Yep. You know, and they're tired of your shit. They'll just go wa- read wa- the old stuff. Watch the old stuff. Buy the old stuff. They don't need your new stuff. That's true. There's so much. I mean, just looking at like Shonen Jump and you know Comicsology uh, Unlimited. There's so much comics content that that no one person could ever read every comic ever made like they they could stop making comics tomorrow and there are, there's thousands of years thousands of years worth of of comics that you could read and not have to buy a damn damn thing at all yeah i mean it'd be like if mcdonald's one day suddenly stopped making uh you know big macs and you know people kept saying we want the big macs back we want the big macs back no you're gonna eat veggie burgers you know you're you know you can't have the big macs back and then another restaurant down the street opens up and offers you something that's like the big mac where do you think the business is gonna go yeah i mean and then they're gonna yell it's because you're it's because you have isms and phobes and phobes and stuff it's like no it's because they told you what they want it's like isms and phobes isms and phobes it's like you didn't listen to what they told you and now you're that you're you're getting what you asked you're getting what you 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 gave you know too bad uh so a lot of these people these uh, you know i hate to use the term i'm gonna use the term a lot of these fake geeks are gonna get pushed out of you know the various some of them are geeks but they want to be geeks on their terms they want to be uh alpha geeks they want right. to be the i mean the i don't want, I don't want to say geeks. fake because there are people that legitimately do like something but they like something as long as it's their, their way terms. yeah it's like right. it's like fan fiction as opposed to the reality right right and that's yeah uh, so let's talk about that but anyway websites in general especially lifestyle especially non-essential websites are declining the ad revenue is declining oh and (laughs) and it's so weird they're complaining about how the ad revenue on refinery 29 is declining on refinery 29 and how unfair it is because all all this person wanted to do was be a journalist and now when they finally break in the the bottom has fallen out unfortunately that happens to us all the time we want to do something and by the time we get there it's too little too late but you know what we do we have to move on to something else you move on but yeah. i was i have to laugh though because um we do the the, the disney vlog as well and what were they telling you that the rates were down uh, like 40 some percent 40 some percent yeah yeah so there's a lot of these uh disney blogs especially the ones that aren't really honest they're more about being suck-ups and shows um, that are taking quite the hit. And I'm, some of them, I'm wondering how they're even still in business when the people that run them are going on about how they have no money. It's going to be really interesting because you can't run a theme park blog when people aren't traveling. And, you you know, nobody wants to see all the... Well, I mean, it was interesting at first, but do you really want to see empty parks and face masks, you know, for months and months and months? And Disney's running out of money, so they're not going to be able to, you know, buy off these blogs like they were And before. then the Instagrammers can't be taking pictures of themselves all over the place. Like, here I am, arms in the air. It's me, it's me, it's me, it's me. Unless we're doing it at their house in front of their hashtag kitchen wall. I mean, hashtag I don't know what else going to do. Hashtag, hashtag green screen. Hashtag bathroom. You know, unless they're doing stuff like that, I don't see where they're going to get a lot of hits because nobody cares. They're trying to hashtag survive. Here's my hashtag my, go to Walmart. Here's my Mickey bathroom. This is where I take my hashtag Disney dumps <laughs> to right. have my hashtag magical moments. And then you sit in the toilet or on the floor of the way your bathroom takes a picture of your you know, arms up in there like here I am. Oh, no. I thought you were gonna say something else. I thought you were gonna say oh, that they take a picture can... of what's in the toilet. No, I'm not doing that. Shape. Look, it's a hidden Mickey. <laughs> it's a hidden Mickey. It looks just like Mickey However, Waffles. It, it was Mickey Waffles. Finding hidden Mickeys is a real thing, though, because we were at the one store the other day and they had these planters, and I I noticed it before, and I hadn't told Neon, and I walked by it, and then he stops and goes, "Oh, look, it's a hidden Mickey," and I was like, I had seen it like two weeks prior. Anyway, it's a problem. But go ahead. Anyway, um, yeah, so all these sites are, are freaking out, and a lot of them were probably up they were propped up by venture capitalists um and the venture capitalists are like hey none of these sites are are paying now they're being so. propped up by like ppp loans yeah and that's we're gonna see a lot of this and we're gonna see a lot of this in comics uh too because there's a lot of well there was basically a three-month reprieve you get you get money for like three months but and we saw you know diamond distribution took it and some other places took it i guarantee you some of these websites took it just to survive because you know look again you've got you know hollywood which is hurting coming out and saying you know youtube and, and blogs aren't worth it hollywood's so, really hurting so they're not going to buy these blogs you know they're they're they can barely give them away i mean look at 
um, freaking Gawker. Gawker went out and then they had Gizmodo and they tried and tried and tried to sell Gizmodo and they sold it for next to nothing. They still had to consolidate. io9's basically gone at this point. We saw Newsarama got absorbed in the game's radar because video games are fine. They're doing fine, but nobody gives well, a Tumblr, shit about Tumblr, all the people comics. that kind of ran everything in the ground to begin with, it got sold for, you know. Three million dollars. Yeah. An individual. There are houses in California that cost more than Tumblr. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, at this point, I don't think, uh, Hollywood, you have the ability to hold out much longer. You're going to have to make cho choices that uh, make financial sense. You you can't just let people dictate what they want because they scream the loudest. Um you, you don't have that luxury anymore. You don't have the money flowing like water, and it's going to be a long time till it returns, especially if you keep alienating all your fans. Yeah, and we're seeing, you know, pushback. Even, you know, at Comic-Con, everybody was talking about how Comic-Con at home, which should have been, you know, I, I think five years ago, it would have been a slam dunk. Like, oh my God, all of our favorite celebrities on panels and we could watch from home on YouTube. Yeah, it would, it would have been the Nerdist crowd, the Geek and Sundry crowd. Uh, it was a huge dud. It was. For the amount of content they had, Speaking they were of dumps. Yeah, <laughs> it was. Comic-Con at home was a huge dud. People aren't razzle-dazzled by the bullshit anymore. And so many people are getting burnt out on so many franchises that the Hollywood uh, woke have have run into the ground. Star Wars is dead. Doctor Who is dead. Star, Star Trek's Trek. dead. Comics are dead. Shira's dead. Thundercats. Um, Thundercats is... I, Thundercats is beyond dead. What's beyond dead? I don't know. Uh, undead uh, should put it down. It should be dead. And so people just don't care. So what's going on is, you know, that that crowd has moved on. They moved on to other YouTubers. They moved on to anime and manga, which these people are trying to infiltrate now. Yeah, they're trying to control all that. We're going to talk. Okay, let's talk about the control issue now. Yeah, let's let's get there. So there's something up. Uh huh. Because we've been saying this, we've been saying this, and I think I think it comes down to well, there was a catalyst, and I think it was that uh, Whisper Network being outed. Yeah, everybody already kind of knew it existed, but now it was confirmed with yeah, the screenshots. Right. So for those of you who haven't watched previous videos, real quick uh, recap: there is a group of female creators on Facebook allegedly possibly maybe part of a a whisper network which th these are basically i guess the the female illuminati of geekdom like you've got comic book editors in there you've got journalists in there you've got people tied to gaming you've got people tied to hollywood and they're all basically trying to control the flow of spice it's just an example of what we've been saying for the last couple of years like you'd see it with the she are like um uh, this one thing would come out that all the hit pieces from the media would come out at the same time it was a concerted targeted effort it's like that just like we said and as soon as this got outed here comes all the articles yeah just within the last couple of weeks there have been all kinds of articles uh, you know, taking pot shots at uh, Comicsgate in particular, which is so weird because, um, you know, Dynamite was actually working with Comicsgate people for months. But they were working with people and like everybody in general. Like, they were like, yeah. you know, they were going to pick a side. Right. But once the Whisper Network got outed, there seemed to be a more concerted effort to destroy Comicsgate. Again, Comicsgate, a bunch of YouTubers who. You know, you can, whatever opinion you have on them, that is entirely up to you. But from my point of view, it's a bunch of former industry professionals and YouTubers who got tired of the system and they wanted to make comics outside the system. They told them to. And they, they told did. them to. And then they did everything they could to stop that too. Right. So Dynamite was working with some of these people and some of the people in the Whisper Network got their panties in a bunch and basically made Dynamite renounce their comics gate association but then it didn't stop there we had uh dc writer tom king come after jay lee uh, another a comics artist well-respected comics artist because he drew a cover for a comicsgate project so everybody lost their shit but it all seemed to happen right after the whisper network thing oh shit we're losing control hurry yes yes because these these are the tastemakers and we're going to talk about <laughs> they don't do a very good job it's taster's choice. Uh, no, they don't do a very good job. He doesn't taste anything. But there is definitely, and I, I think this is probably one of many, and we know it exists with, with uh, journalists too, with gaming mm -hmm. journalists and comic book journalists who are tied into this. But all of these people, there's like a Venn diagram 
Uh, they all came in about, I would say they came in about eight years ago. They really started to have influence about five years ago. And then they ago. kept pulling their friends in. They kept pulling their friends in. So this is, you know, and it all ties in with Nerdist and with, um, you know, a lot of these other comic book well, blogs and publishers. Lot, well, comic books, you see a lot of times they write for like several different places. And that's, yeah. I've even seen before where there was an article on one and all these other articles that were similar appeared to other ones because it's all written by the same person. They just put a different spin on it for each one. And then it's and they're like, wow, they're all covering it. Well, if you look into it, sometimes they weren't all covering it. It was one person going around to all the places they work and covering it. Right. So when... Um, Comicsgate first kind of started, there was a concerted effort to smack it down. And you had a lot of journalists that were like, they wrote for like five different publications. Mm -hmm. They basically write different versions of the anti-Comicsgate yep. article. Yeah. And, um, but that's the thing. You've got a, a relatively small group of people controlling the narrative by carpet bagging from blog to blog to blog. Um, and personally, I, I don't know if that should even be allowed. Like, I, I understand freelance writing, and I think there are some laws now that are going to curtail, curtail that in, in uh, California. But, you know, it used to be with newspapers and magazines, usually you had a staff writer. They weren't, you didn't have somebody writing for this magazine and these 19 other magazines mm -hmm. because that's ki kind of a conflict of interest. But with digital journal journalists, I'm using my fingers here, uh, air quotes. Yeah, you better explain what you're using your fingers for. Yeah, I'm using my yeah, I'm using yeah. one finger more than the others. Uh, but yeah, they're basically just magnifying their voices. This is all about platform. And if you can go from, you know, who knows? I mean, you might have people writing under pseudonyms on other websites too. That's true. It might only be like three people that are writing 40 hit pieces. You know, you have no idea. Right. And it looks like there's more outrage than there actually is because, again, because that Hollywood connection, they know how... The game is played. They know that these these studios are constantly checking the Google News Feed. So the keyword stuff to get their attention. Right. And we've seen them before where they're trying to do a hit piece and they wouldn't keyword things that they tried to bring things in that had really had nothing to do with it just because they were popular keywords. Right. Um, it, it's stupid. Um, so we have all these. So this comes out about the Whisper Network. Now all these articles appear. Um, you know, I have to laugh about the one that's the CBR one about. We're, we're going to get there. Kelly Sudeconic, Yeah. Though. Uh, but yeah, we're get, we're getting all these. Now we've got hit pieces against Marvel Comics uh, not being diverse enough. I'm like, again, where where were these hit pieces just two months ago? It's not being diverse enough. It's not diverse enough. Okay, I'm sorry. What, what do you th wait? They're thinking that's why the sales are down. Is that what they're trying to argue? That's not diverse yes. enough. Okay, no, you are wrong. 100% wrong. But you know what? You go ahead. You try and do that. You know, just you know, go ahead. Feel free. We'll just sit back and watch. That, yeah, you weren't here for that video. The, the, the shocking thing about this is finding out that Marvel editors only make like $35,000 a year in Manhattan. Are you serious? I am I am dead serious. Okay, that's nuts. School teachers in rural areas make more money yes. than Marvel Comics editors. Okay, so that's one of those things you have to have like 10 roommates or, you know, yes. have a, a, a spouse that makes money. So it's no wonder so oh, many of these bad. people are bitter. And you get what you pay for. And a lot of these editors, and honestly, look, I'll tell you the truth. At least, you know, in regards to Marvel, this is Disney cost cutting because Disney is not making the kinds of kind of money on Marvel comics that they think they should be making. So they're going to pay them on the cheap. And it, frankly, if people are willing to work for $35,000 a year in Manhattan, that they want to work in comics that badly, I don't know what to tell you, because you could go do literally anything else. And, what, and what's funny is, they, all these people that make they'll make a lot of money will try to like do crowdfunding, and it won't work for them. And then it'll work for other people that they pushed out. And and, and they still try to say that it's not because of, of how they're handling things. Right. But we have, okay, so this is like, you know, in the last five years, they've only hired uh, two black editors. Again, it seems like... Because maybe the rest of them are smart enough to work someplace else. <laughs> I don't know, maybe. Um, it seems to me like there are a lot of cards that have been held in the in the, the hand that are being played now because of the Whisper Network thing coming out. Well, maybe people are applying that are, are black because they, they know that doesn't pay worse shit and they're like, I don't have time for this crap. That is very possible. Maybe that's the reason why you aren't getting diversity is because you're only getting a bunch of women who like to scream on Twitter to apply for jobs and you're not getting an actual diverse group because you don't pay enough. That is true. I mean, look, I'm sorry. You know, just because somebody offers you a job 
if it only pays $35,000 a year in Manhattan doesn't mean you have to take that job. I no. mean, I, I love comics, but uh, I remember back in the day, I was, I was thinking about moving to New York actually. And I was looking at some jobs and they were paying 50, $60,000 a year in the, like the late nineties, early two thousands. And I had a friend of mine be like, you can't afford to live in Manhattan on that. No. Like, you're not going to be able to afford to live. But it's less now, but the costs have gone up. And yeah. it's like, I, your take, their takeaway is, well, you're not employee enough. My takeaway is they're too smart to, you know, to, to take it. Yeah. Why wouldn't you go? I mean, when Kickstarter is paying their people, well, we're going to talk about that too. Kickstarter was paying their people, a lot of them, over six figures. And they don't actually have to make any comics. All they got to do is push a button. Is this one good? Is this one bad? Here's your money. There's your money. Whatever. Um, but, uh, that blew up too, but yeah, this came out and we had, you know, now there's all kinds of talks about uh, allegations. Again, these are things that people have known for years, but they didn't play the card. Now, same with dynamite. They didn't play that card. Uh, they knew for months that dynamite was working with comics gate, but they play it now to me. This seems like this is, this is it. This is the 11th hour. This is all the stuff that we've been holding on to for years, all the dirt. Last ditch effort. Last ditch effort because we're losing control. We know we're losing. Um, so before we get into that, let's bring up the definition of, of gatekeeping. The activity of controlling and usually limiting general access to something. Is that what the one you're looking at? Yep. Yep. That is it. Because we're going to talk about... The, the, the lie about gatekeeping? Yeah. So... The complaint, the biggest complaint of Comicsgate for years has been that the comic book industry, because these people got in and they got into a position of power, or at least not necessarily power, but they had they were in proximity to power that they could control who got in, who didn't get in, um, is that the comic book industry has been gatekept. And now we've got one of the people who has basically been a gatekeeper. Kelly Sue DeConnick, who keeps pushing for Captain Marvel mm -hmm. to be a thing, even no, though people don't really care for it. They they they, they like Carol Danvers in they the seventies. They watched the movie because they wanted to see. They thought they had to see it to go to the final movie. You ask people how many times they've watched it again. Most have, don't. So one of one of the women who uh, you know basically came out. She came out like a year or two ago. Oh no, twenty seventeen when all the shit hit the fan and said, "Well, if you don't like my comics, their political wah wah don't work in comics." Well, first of all, it's. Clearly a fake redhead. That's all I need to know. I mean, red. She's trying to be a redhead. Redhead is a a, a to be. A, you have to be a real redhead to pull it off. Um, otherwise, you just come across like that. So, um, clearly not a real redhead. Uh, I want to be, which is you know kind of sad. I, I you know, but you're you're not going to be a redhead. So stop trying. That's why she's so grumpy. She so, always looks grumpy in pictures. She does. She, she does. So here's the thing. She is completely plugged into the Portland comic book scene. She is. She is probably part of the gatekeeping. I don't know if she's part of the Whisper Network or not, but um, for some reason, for some reason, her her voice carries some weight, right? Well, here's the thing that's me in this article, okay? Um, which is a load of shit, by the way. Um, she goes on about, uh, you know, how they should use agents to get in. A couple things here. 10 to 1, she has one, and so do her friends. I'm pretty sure she does. Okay. Yeah. Here's the thing about agents. We had an agent. We had one of the big agents for one of the really, really, really big agencies. And this agent is known to wrap a lot of the people that are in the Whisper Network, actually, around yes. other things, you know? Isn't and, that And, um, you know, they stalled us out for months because we apparently got in just in time for the, the, the shift to happen that if you didn't have the right check marks, if you weren't diverse enough, you didn't get you didn't get uh, your book picked up. Right so politics. instead, they, they, they picked up the other people and then the, the books didn't sell. But, you know, again, you, it's again, their own fault but this person stalled us out deliberately to get some of these other people through and um agents actually when we we went and got more on our own than we'd ever do with the agent he actually hindered us more than helped us that's the one who told me i wasn't feminist enough yeah he told me a woman i wasn't a feminist i wasn't feminist enough because my character was happy that a boy smiled at her this this is what is so uh, infuriating about this because we've got kelly sue DeConnick, who's part of what a lot of people are calling the portland comics mafia uh, saying that she hopes for a future less reliant on industry gatekeepers as her and her ilk constantly throw shade at Comics Gate, which is trying to do just that. that right, and then she an also gets in there, well, people should be agented. That is the most gate-kept system, and we're going to we'll yeah, talk about Yeah, it's a load that. of shit, guys. I'm telling you. We've been there. We've done it. So she said she hopes for a future in which aspiring creators no longer have to answer to industry gatekeepers. So do I, so stop the Whisper Network. Stop the Whisper Network. You guys are the gatekeepers. 
and we're going to talk about look before we get into it any, any further might as well just rip this band-aid off uh kickstarter was an option for comic book creators to do an end run around gatekeepers and what did you do you installed one of your own people, Camilla Zhang, you put her in there to gatekeep. To gatekeep the, the projects. The, the reason crowdfunding did well was because they didn't need your approval. So you didn't like that because what was going on was no one wanted your shit, no matter where you put it. So when other people were buying other stuff, you wrongly thought, well, if we get rid of them, they'll have to spend money on our stuff. But again, just because you kick them out doesn't mean people are going to buy your junk. They'll just go someplace else. They'll just go down the street to the other Big Mac. You know, they, they're not going to buy your shit just because you block other people. So there was a system that worked. And, and I remember we talked about multiple times when Kickstarter first happened, when when uh, web comics first happened, the mainstream comics media threw shade at those uh -huh. people big time. They and called it e-bagging and everything else. E-bagging, everything they could do. They were very dismissive and, and derisive. And if you were a real creator, you'd have a deal. That was the, that was the attitude. Yeah, pretty much. Oh no, literally. I know, literally. There was actually a blog post on First Second Books where they were very, very salty that some people were going to Kickstarter because they were basically like, "Well, wouldn't you rather be at the real publisher doing real comics?" Why first you come, Second, real publisher. Yeah, why didn't you come to us first? When their books actually sell, get back to me. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So there, there was a system set up, and the comic book industry this collective, this almost hive mind, the Portland Comics Mafia, put one of their own people in there to gatekeep. And what happened was everybody ran away from Kickstarter. They, they took a 40 or 35% hit to their bottom line. They had to lay off 40% of their staff. Including that person. Including well, Camilla Zhang. She left, but they never tell you whether they got their butts They bought out. her out, they bought her out. She got, she got her ass fired because she cost them money. Well, you think. No, that's what happened. They actually said that she, she got, got fired. She got, she was part of the layoffs. Yes, they downsized. And mm -hmm. She was part of the layoffs. Um, I think it's because of the union. She was one of the ones pushing for the union. And the union also cost them a bunch of money. Because again, you've got Marvel editors making $35,000 a year in Manhattan. You got people working for Kickstarter in Brooklyn or whatever, or San Francisco making, making a hundred and some thousand dollars a year just to push buttons. Yeah. They're not even really making anything. They're working a lot. Uh, less than, than the people working for Marvel. Um, Patreon was another system. Patreon was another system, and they decided they were going to gatekeep that too. Now, we did a video the other day on Patreon. We actually didn't post it because uh, we weren't sure if we had all the, the legalese right, but the long and short of it is, is Patreon is probably going to be sued into oblivion for being biased. Yeah, well, at least they're being, they, they had a bunch of claims and they're trying to counter sue. And it's like, it, who it's knows a lot of happen. stupid stupidity. It's a lot of stupid. But Patreon, again, they've been accused of being biased, of being gatekeepers. They, they raise prices on their fees. They've, you know, they've, you know, their safety and whatever, trust and safety board went after people. And then when you ask them for like a clear cut guideline, they wouldn't give you one. It was a case by case basis till you repented. Yeah. I mean, yeah. no one wants to deal with, why do you want to deal with the headache that if I actually say something someplace else that isn't even on their platform, I'm going to lose my Patreon. It's not worth the shit. It's just not worth it. So there were, there were absolutely systems set up uh, to do end runs around the comic book gatekeepers and you know people like Kelly Sue DeConnick people like the Whisper Network made sure that it was impossible for people to do that so she was interviewed for the Hollywood Reporter uh, talked about various allegations of abuse and misconduct but there's abuse and misconduct through you know uh, these networks as well yep um, well, the, oh God, this is, this is, I know. Incredible. I love this. I, okay. I thought you'd like that. So she talked about the abuse misconduct. Again, a lot of this was known for a while. They just waited until now to play mm -hmm. the card. But there's abuse and misconduct on, uh, from women too. Yes. Yeah, so you don't hear about, uh, you don't hear about Hope Nicholson and Bedside Press very often. Well, uh, you do hear. <laughs> do you know? We're like the only ones who talked about it. Uh, DeConnick touched upon how networks of gatekeepers, networks of gatekeepers, like editors and established freelance talent are often those who recruit new creators for publishers rather than those creators being optioned for jobs through agents. Basically, they hire their friends. Yes, which, uh, yeah. And they're basically complaining because they said they all hired their friends, and they're, and, but at the same time, they are all hiring their friends. That's why you see such a decline and all these people showing up out of nowhere. And if you try to come in from the side, you try to do an end run around these people, they will find a way to 
destroy or dismiss or you. Or try to, to do their best to try to badmouth you or whatever. Yeah, we've, we've been down this Because they're sad way. people doing sad things. At the end of the day, they're just a bunch of sad sacks doing sad things. So she's upset that they're not being optioned for jobs through agents. Agents, that whole system is the most gate kept system. Mm -hmm. Like the whole, and that's a whole nother video, but talking about uh, literary agents and traditional publishers and like the New York Times bestseller list and all of this, that is the most locked down gate gate kept system ever. It sounds to me like she didn't get the gig she wanted through her agent, so now she's gonna whine that we, about we it. We should have agents. Well, it's funny too, because we actually talked to a couple of the top, top agents that deal with, you know, the graphic novels and stuff. Yeah. Back when, when we, before we got with one agent. And the, the one person, I'm not gonna say who it was, but their their mo was to to sit down and have a discussion with you, where they basically you know try to, to to slam on you and tell you you know talk down to you and tell you you know like I don't know how would you describe it like you know um, know your place know your place know but your the whole place. reason is is so that they can control you easier. Well, you can imagine how well that went over. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, it, it was well. actually talked to Neon, and not me. Um, but you know, it did it did not go over. So we obviously didn't get picked by that person because we weren't going to be easily controlled. Yeah, which is so weird because my understanding from other people I talk to is if you get to talk with this person, this person is is very influential in the uh, you know the publishing scene with like you know the the publisher like first, second, Scholastic, et cetera, like that. If you get to talk to that person, ninety nine point nine percent of the time, that person picks you up wouldn't pick us up because we did ask a lot of questions. We did push back. And, and then we went with the other person because the other person offered to pick us up. And then she was mad about that. And then that other person stalled us out to get their other people in. Mm -hmm. and a lot that, of people on the Whisper Network was using you to get to our agent to get deals for other people. That is true. Some of the people on that Whisper Network, I know, were, were picking my brain to try to get a hold of, of our agent at the time. And then the funny thing ab about that was we parted ways with that agent because that agent was furious that we pitched something to Disney and didn't involve him. Because but it wouldn't. It wasn't a book. It wasn't a book. And he would have just made it way more complicated. Um, mm -hmm. And he wasn't doing anything for us anyway. So we're like. And we didn't sign him that, wouldn't that, that, no. that said we had to let him do that. No, books. Yeah, they had first look. But uh, TV series, they had no. We we're allowed to do whatever we wanted. And uh, he was very, very angry because he couldn't gatekeep. And uh, we did get we did get two options actually. Mm -hmm. uh, options. N nothing got greenlit, but we got options. Uh, we did it ourselves. Mm -hmm. So that was our experience. Agents with, are a waste of time. Uh, for the most part, if you find a good one that actually knows their place and they know they work for you, mm -hmm. I, I think that they can probably be invaluable because they can be out there looking for work while you're doing work. And they're not trying to be a femme male. Yeah. Like a feminist man. A, a femme male. <laughs> a feminist man. Try to tell the woman that she's not feminist enough. Yeah, but most of them, they're just, they're on a power trip. They want to be the gatekeepers. They want to control what gets published and whatever. Uh, and the thing is, is all these people are completely unnecessary now. And that's why they're all freaking out. Uh, they're all freaking out. So this is what Kelly Sue DeConnick says. She said there was a, a, a power, an unbalanced and potentially abusive power dynamic unless you use yeah there i agree there is an unbalance and a potentially abusive power dynamic going on right now um i guess i should say it like this there is an unbalanced power dynamic right now i'm not saying who it is but i'm giving you a clue so she said when new people get brought in they're brought in by people who are already working uh, there's no traditional ladder so that while well, they're you mean used that to they're be bringing all their friends in they're doing the exact same damn thing yes. they've been. Isn't it hypocritical? So the way people have gotten in is through these powerful gatekeepers. Yeah, you, who's you, the powerful gatekeepers right now? Who are the ones gatekeeping the hell out of everything right now? Could it be them? Could it be them? Could it be them? A lot of these powerful gatekeepers are super lovely, but there ought to be another way. She said, oh, DeConnick admits she's one of the gatekeepers. She's also advocated for publishers to require that prospective creative talent use agents. Who she and her friends likely have. To pursue opportunities on their behalf like individuals working in film and television do. No, I'm telling you what is going on. The agent system is the most gate kept thing ever. And it sounds to me like she got her panties in a bunch. She didn't get something. Somebody else knew somebody and got it. Or it just sounds, well, yeah, and they didn't have an agent she did or something. But you know, they like said, I do agree with this. Uh, always hire lawyers. Yes, yes. that I 100% agree with. Yes. Uh, we always have our, our contracts checked by lawyers, always. If something like that were available, it would decrease. The, you just hire a lawyer. 
You go hire an entertainment lawyer. We got an entertainment lawyer. What the problem is, they don't work for free. You got to pay them. Mm -hmm. So maybe there is a power imbalance there because you actually got, if you're making $35,000 a year working at Marvel, living in Manhattan, you can't afford a lawyer that costs hundreds of dollars an hour. I'm sorry. That's, you know, I yeah. don't know what to tell you. Um, you get what you I, I, pay I, for. Yeah, I, I'm just like, I just, this whole <laughs> article was nothing but uh, double talk, double speak the it whole way through. Absolutely it, 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 was a, it, was, it just amused me. Um, I'm surprised there aren't more comments. I actually had one, but I didn't post it. Um, but it's like the gay, the, the agents thing is, yeah, this, yeah, agents, agents. Okay. This, this really infuriates me because there are literally only four or five agents in mainstream publishing. As far as I'm aware of, it might've changed, but I, I, I think I'm right. That actually take on comic book clients. Well, I think a lot of them want to jump to other things like television and movies, and that's yes. what the whole thing's about. Yes. So you know there are some some t uh, TV agencies, or whatever. CAA though is one of the biggest agencies out there. They're the ones working with Webtoon. They just lay off like 300 people. Hollywood's not doing great either. This this sounds to me like I, I mean what she's basically saying is I I want to advocate for a future without gatekeepers by using my agent, which is a gatekeeper, to get and, me and jobs. I'm a gatekeeper. You know, Mr. a gatekeeper. Yeah, so I'm going to get the job over you because I got my agent, and there's only a handful of people that do. I want to take a moment to advocate for uh, Redhead Lives Matter, Redheads, say the Redheads, um, the real Redheads, not the ones like her who dye their hair red. Yeah, so um, anyway. Well, I'm you know, sorry. <laughs> to, to get back to the point, to get back to the point, the point is all of this stuff has started in the last week or two. I think it's it's in reaction to the uh, Whisper Network being exposed. Um, and now they're playing a bunch of cards here because it's it's just in general, this whole- uh, It Holly ramped up after God. Yeah, Hollywood geek culture is going to implode. And it's they keep, all they, well, the blogs keep getting bought up. They keep laying people off. And there's not that many gigs. If you do get one, they're getting paid like a few dollars an hour for a story. Yeah. So it's like, there's no money in it. So what, what, what's the loss? What's the loss here? Ha ha, we win. So you have an industry where there's no money. You get paid $35,000 and that's the editor job in Manhattan, or you get five bucks an article to be on these big blogs. And then the industry is burning down around you and everybody else went somewhere else and, and took the audience with them and made money there. You can have it. Congratulations. You're the winner. Yeah, you can Good have job. it. Um, you know, but I, I want to hold her to that. So if people do an end run around the mainstream comic book industry. They can't say anything. You can't say anything. If you do it without an agent, you do it on your own. You, you go outside the system. You can't bitch about when somebody goes and makes a million bucks. Yeah. And you know what? And just because you try to block them doesn't mean that they're going to spend the money on you. Yeah, they'll just go someplace else. So this is good. Yeah, they'll go someplace that has what they want. If you're not giving yeah. them what they want and you're blocking the people that give them what they want, they'll just go someplace else out of, outside of your control to get what they want. So you're still not going to win. You're just wasting time and resources. So, you know, how about you just worry about doing good stories with good characters and worrying about just doing your best job you can do instead of, you know, who you can get in, all your friends you can get in, and what agendas you can push and who you can control. Um, because at the end of the day, you're just the, you're king of the crap. Pretty much, you you can have it because the people who can make things, they're they're going off and they're they're doing it, and uh, you know it's not gatekeeping; it's called survival because you made you gate kept them out of the industry, and now they're trying to survive and they're going to go find a workaround. I think the big companies in general that own this stuff, they're tired of losing money. Yeah. As, as, as nothing else from 2020 has proven to these people that you know we're going to have to look at where we're hemorrhaging funds and find a way to fix it or cut it off. Yep. So congratulations um, by, you know, standing there yelling at everyone who doesn't agree with you and calling them names and bullying people and chasing off customers. You have done nothing but probably made yourself obsolete. So congratulations. Congratulations. Way to think ahead there. All right. So we're going to wrap this one up. Yep. Please subscribe for more pop culture news, views, and rants. And we'll talk to you guys later. Bye. Hey, guys. Thanks for watching Clownfish TV. Please consider supporting the channel. Go to clownfishsupport.com. That's clownfishsupport.com and if you want to join our community go to clownfishtalk.com that's clownfishtalk.com please subscribe ring the bell for notifications we will talk to you next time